Hello everyone and welcome to my talk. I'm Jorge Terol Calvo from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias in Tenerife and I'm going to present my recent work with Jorge Martin Kamalich, Laura Toros and Robert Ziegler on supernova constraints on dark flavor sectors. So there are several types of supernovae. One of them is the thermonuclear supernovae, another one is the core collapse supernovae. And there's a third one, which is the attack from Freezer from Dragon Ball Z. But in this talk, I'm going to talk about core collapse supernovae. Uh, uh, the core collapse supernovae occur when uh, the iron core of a red giant collapses gravitationally, and it starts the formation of a proton-neutron star. Uh, this uh, proton-neutron star bounces and uh, creates a shock wave on the outer layers of the of the red giant star which in the end it explodes uh, radiating a huge amount of energy which is most of it carried by the by the neutrinos the mission of neutrinos and these neutrinos are expected to have an average energy of 10 MeVs, and the duration of the pulse of the mission is around 10 seconds in 1987 there was a a supernovae observed in, the, in our cosmic neighborhood in the large Magellanic cloud. And nowadays, in the same spot, it has been observed some, some hints of the neutron star in the very same spot. And it was detected at that time some neutrinos, some few events, which had an average energy of around 10 MeVs. The duration of the pulse was around 10 seconds. So we believe that this observation was a confirmation of, of this core collapse uh, supernovae mechanism. And this tells us that if there was another cooling mechanism for the proton neutron star, uh, the neutrino pulse would be altered. So this gives us a, a bound, which is known as the supernova 1987A cooling bound, which tells us that the dark luminosity, the luminosity with this new cooling mechanism by some new interaction on new particle cannot be larger than the luminosity of neutrinos, roughly this number. And we propose a strange cooling mechanism. Of course, I'm talking about hyperons because in the proton neutron star, the temperatures and density reach it uh, enables the production of lambda hyperons. And if these lambda hyperons would decay to a neutron and a dark boson, general dark boson, uh, this would be a new way of cooling for the proton neutron star. So one can calculate the spectrum of this cooling rate, uh, which has a dependence on the, of the rate in vacuum of this decay, of the distribution of the lambdas and the neutrons, the energies, and this expression can be simplify with some approximations to get to very, this very simple expression that only depends on the decay rate, the average temperature of the, of the proton neutron star and the lambda density of the neutron. This is useful to make some uh, back on the envelope uh, calculations, get some numbers, but we have done all our work with the full, with the full expression, which agrees quite with the, with the very simple uh, approximation. So, we have to take into account, of course, uh, the inverse process uh, for the absorption of these X0 bosons. So a neutron can capture this X0 and become a lambda. We have taken into account this doing a detailed balance analysis. The one can get the mean free path and the optical depth, which it is included in the, in the dark luminosity calculations with a damping, with a damping term here. And in the very strong coupling limit, uh, where the mean free path is smaller than the radius of the proton neutron star, what we get is a dark sphere uh, that emits like a, like a black body with this expression. To compute this luminosity, we have used the latest uh, one dimension supernova simulations, which include uh, to different equation of the state, the Latimer and Svesti and the Steiner von Pell and Fischer, and with different masses for the SFHO uh, that give different uh, masses of the neutron star that is produced after the supernovae. Um, 
one gets uh, the radial profiles. This is, for example, one second after the bounce. And one can see that the difference on the density is not very large, but in the temperature, the heavier neutron star produced are hotter than, than the lighter one. And of course, this equation of state do not include hyperamps, but this is not a problem because this equation of state have some extensions with the hyperamps, the LS220 lambda and the SFHO y. Uh, is this consistent to use this equation of state while we have um, simulations without hyperons? In principle, yes, because for the relevant uh, quantities, uh, it has been shown in the literature that there is no much difference between this uh, equation of state, with hyperons or without hyperons, unless you get to densities uh, much higher than the ones reached in a proton neutron star, which is already high. One thing important to note is that the equation of state of latium asbesti with hyperons does not reproduce the neutron star observations on constraints. So we won't use uh, this result as our final result, but we have calculated it as well to just to know that our procedure works. So we have modified these simulations with this uh, equation of state uh, with hyperons, we have done this with uh, the compose database uh, that gives you some interpolation tab tables that allows you to, uh, to calcula calculate the relevant quantities such as the density of the hyperons and here we can, we can see the radio profiles of the density of hyperons. For the case of the LS220 lambda, we can see that in the in the center, central region of the neutron star, which the density is higher, and there are a lot of lambdas produced, and even uh, there are a lot of lambdas produced as well in in the region where was the hotter uh, the hotter spot in the neutron star. For the case of the SFHY, the density effects are not so relevant, but still the temperature effects are, and we have calculated as well how would be the profile if one gets, we uses only the, the simulation without hyperons and produces hyperons just by term thermal effects, you know, using as a, treating uh, the hyperons as a free Fermi gas and producing, producing it just by thermal effects and we get uh, in an important amount of the of hyperons in the hotter region. So with all of this, we have computed our luminosity as a function of the branching ratio of this decay, and we get the most conservative result, which is order 10 to the minus 8 for this branching ratio, uh, which it is given by, uh, by this simulation. And let me stress that this is model independent. This is a general dark boson, X0, that uh, allows for this decay. And now you will wonder if this is relevant, if it is easy to, to build a model with this kind of interactions and dark boson. And I have to say, yes, some, there exist some dark flavored sectors, uh, some portals that connect this dark sector and the standard model can have a rich flavor structure. So dark flavor exists. An example of that is the massless dark photon one can rotate the two U1 fields in such a way that the that photon massless, let me stress this, does not interact directly with the standard model and only couples through higher dimension operators, this kind of operators, dimension six, which below the electroweak scale become the, the famous dimension five operator uh, uh, dipole-like, but instead of with a photon, with a dark photon. And there are some models that can generate these, these operators with a flavor structure. Another example is the axion. Uh, already in the 80s, it was proposed the axion as a solution to the flavor puzzle, so giving this kind of couplings to, to the axion, or even models with uh, non-universal non pH charges. 
and even some standard model uh, relative corrections to these couplings of the action with the, with the quarks can generate this flavor violation. So if we apply our bounds to these models, we get some results. For example, for the action, we get uh, a bound on the, on the scale uh, of order 10 to the 9 GBs for both the vector and the axial current. Compared with other, uh, with other bounds, we can see that the vector, the vector current or the bound on the vector current is not competitive with the laboratory in one with the K and the K, which is much higher. But in the case of the axial one, it gives the strongest, the strongest limit, even stronger than the prospects of future experiments on hyper and decays. For the massive action like particle, it is more or less the same, uh, the same result, unless one gets two masses which are in the, in the region that is almost forbidden kinematically, which is the difference of the mass of the lambda and the neutron. And it is important this result for a massive action like particle because in the vectorial case, uh, the k on the k on bound, the k on the k bound that I have shown you before, uh, loses all the sensitivity in the region between 100 and 160 MeVs over the mass of the dark boson because it is a region where there is a, a huge background of the k to 2 pi decay and therefore uh, in this region our uh, our band becomes very competitive in comparison to the laboratory one. For the case of dark photon we have this dipole-like operator as I have told you and assuming order one couplings we get a bound of the order of 10 to the 10 GB is on the UV scale and compared to other bounds it is the strongest limit on quark couplings and we can see that in particular for this uh, coupling that allows for this decays it is much stronger than the laboratory ones on hyperon and kion decays and the prospective one on future experiments of hyperon decays. So this is the end of my talk and as a takeaway message I want you to believe, as I do, that the fusion of astrophysics and flavor physics uh, give exciting new results. Thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. And of course, like the video and subscribe.